The Los Angeles Clippers should be ashamed of themselves. And you know it has to be something big if it should bring shame to that franchise. Snookered me. You know what? I want to know what people are, people are saying. Well, would you consider Anthony Davis and LeBron's uh, tenure in the Lakers a success? Well, if the Lakers, if AD and LeBron isn't a success, what the hell is Paul George and Kawhi? All I got to tell you is if Kawhi gets as healthy as I'm told that he will get off the surgery and Paul George can stay healthy next year, the Clippers will be the team to beat in the Western Conference. Yeah. Book Think it. About now I know. My first video on this platform, and somehow, I'm siding with Skip. Trust me, this wasn't planned. But through sitting through multiple interviews, talk shows, and media bites trying to prove the negative narrative of the Clippers, I was shocked to learn that Skip, for once, was saying something that I thought was valid. If Paul George can stay healthy, if Kawhi Leonard can stay healthy, they will. when has Kawhi stayed healthy? The next year. Okay. That's when. Next year. The thing that is seemingly inevitable, but always forgotten. You may be asking yourself, why is that? How can we as fans and viewers of the game just forget all about the future of the game? Well, the answer is quite simple. Demand. Demand for a headline and demand for instant gratification. Every NBA fan wants their team to be the relevant champion. In recent years, it's gotten so bad that NBA media will nationally dismiss in-season and or postseason success because all they want to speak of is who's hoisting the NBA Finals trophy. It seems like just yesterday we'd see a young team lose in a final series or a Western or Eastern Conference final series and think, man, the future will always be bright for them. Call me crazy, but I just think the average NBA fan is less patient these days. Now before you go into the comments typing about how the entire point of playing is to win and that these teams are sacrificing their future prospects for current success, I ask, how much success have you seen? An NBA team's logic is to win at whatever cost. In recent history, We've seen more teams than ever willing to flip their future for superstar talent that they believe would result in an NBA championship. Teams in recent memory, like the Nets, the Hawks, and the Timberwolves have gone big in the direction of do it now and worry about it later. To be fair, I do respect the idea of risking it all and trying to win it all. Kenny, or Kenny for real, says it very well and his one agent or trade predictions for every NBA team video. And I think if Rudy Gobert is traded, that's the idea. We don't, we're not thinking about his contract at the end of it because if we trade for Rudy right now, we're automatically one of the best defensive teams in the league. We automatically have a chance depending on what the rest of your pieces are. So that's what I think is going, the way these teams are, are convincing themselves Rudy Gobert is the dude. However, what if I told you there was a team out there that was doing both? Getting superstar talent through blockbuster moves, but also maintaining a winning environment with young talent. Well, there may be, but we'll come back to that. Let's take a look at the last three teams that have won the title and their opponents. First, and most recent in memory, we have none other than Golden State versus Boston. Golden State defeated the Celtics 4-2. The series showcased two teams that were built primarily through the draft and outcast type players that bought into or for some Celtics players are still buying into the system. For those of you wondering, what's the system? Well, the system, by my definition, is a basketball team or club that consists of players that have devoted their demeanor, attitude, and all energy into winning. Believing that each and every person on the court wearing the same jersey as you will make the most winningest basketball play. There is no fear to pass in the system. There is no fear of making mistakes in the system. The system has a good coach. The system has a winning environment and culture. Now, back to finals history. The year before this, the 2021 NBA Finals showcased the respected number one seed Phoenix Suns host the Milwaukee Bucks as they went up 2-0 before ultimately losing 4-2. The Suns have been built through the draft and some minor trades and free agency signings. Some notable ones being Chris Paul, JaVale McGee, Jay Crowder, and Dario Saric. 
While the victorious Bucks are for the most part homegrown where it matters, with their two max contract talents starting their careers being drafted or traded to Milwaukee. Then, to me, the most interesting series of the three. 2020, the LA Lakers defeat the Miami Heat in a surprisingly thrilling six-game series. While the bubble supplied NBA content depraved fans of many memorable moments, it gave us a finals to be confused about. And here's why. Oh, you don't get it? Asterix. Asterix are why NBA fans, NBA players, and media outlets were all confused. Due to the world situation and the ramping up of injuries and players missing time with health and safety protocols, it didn't matter which series it was, whether it was round one or the finals, there was something to be said about the matchup. Some were even offended, calling it a Mickey Mouse ring or a Walt Disney ring. Now, you can be mad at the Lakers per se, but they were just playing who was in front of them. I actually found it pretty funny though that there's a Wikipedia page dedicated to the definition of what this insult means. On to their opponent, the Miami Heat, who are seemingly a bit similar to the Clippers, but they're not as quite talented yet, or at least they definitely weren't in 2020. But they have and had superstar talent in Jimmy Butler, paired with a lot of homegrown young drafted talent, and they still have draft capital and assets to improve on, not to mention their Hall of Fame coach and legendary head of front office office and former coach Pat Riley. When you see a team that's homegrown, you generally want to see them win more. So when we see a team like the Nuggets that also is homegrown with Jamal, Jokic, and MPJ lose in the fashion that they did to the Lakers, it makes you almost bitter to watch the next round. Not to mention the Heat did suffer and run into injuries with Bam and Goran Dragic throughout the series. Regardless, at the end of the day, a super team, or super duo I guess, won the NBA Finals. But where are they now? What were they doing last year? And what will they achieve this year? Well, it's hard to say. First, let's back up a bit. On June 15th, 2019, the LA Lakers shocked the world, sending Lonzo Ball, Josh Hart, Brandon Ingram, three first round picks, two pick swaps, and the number one 2019 pick, which if you don't remember, is Zion Williamson, to the New Orleans Pelicans for Anthony Davis. As a fan Alonzo and some of the other young pieces moved in this deal, I kind of scratched my head at it, but every situation is different. At the time of this trade, LeBron was around 35 years old, literally 12 to 15 years older than some of his teammates. The timeline just did not fit. I saw, and now we all continue to see the potential of former Lakers who didn't get the shine in LA as much as time would have let them. But again, time was of the essence. The Lakers finished the 2019-2020 NBA season in an impressive 52 and 19, finishing as the one seed in the Western Conference. They went on to go an impressive 12-3 in their postseason quest to the finals before defeating the Heat in six games. The year after that, the Lakers tried to double down on the super team by sacrificing their first round pick and whatever wing depth they had in Kyle Kuzma, Montrez Harrell, and KCP for Russell Westbrook. Here was the problem the Lakers didn't evaluate before this. There was no system. I'm not here to say that Lakers don't deserve or didn't earn their championship, but think about it. Here's a list of red flags I personally think anyone handling an organization would have seen before making this move for Westbrook, and then some more that were noticeable in the first 20 games. When you have someone as talented as LeBron running your team, someone who is willing to pass, someone who is known for his facilitating, it just doesn't make sense to me why the Lakers weren't and still aren't consistently trying to surround him and people who can shoot and are willing to move their feet on defense. The Lakers are the oldest team in the league. You can look at the average up if you're so curious. And it just makes you wonder why they're going in that direction rather than people who are excited to get out there and run. We see these guys who randomly will pop up on a little minimum contract with the LA effect that are much younger in LA like Malik Monk and he provides this great energy off the bench or when he starts he's super athletic, he can shoot the ball, he's willing to move on defense. If you watch the Lakers this year, which let's be honest there wasn't much good to watch, but if you watched some of these games where Malik Monk absolutely turned into like 
I don't even know, dude. He was pinning people off the backboard, catching bodies, getting back on defense. He's just trying to make that contract, and that's why he got one in Sacramento. I'm not a big believer in the Kings, but watching the few Lakers games I did last year and seeing Malik Monk hoop was very fun. That brings me to the next point, their durability over an 82 game season, just to quickly touch on that. They're the oldest team in the league. I think the thought process maybe of signing Westbrook was, hey, if we sign Westbrook, maybe we, if LeBron gets hurt or LeBron wants to do some form of load management, then Westbrook can tap into that MVP Westbrook and, you know, at least carry us to the playoffs. Because let's be honest, it doesn't matter if you're the one seed, the eight seed, or you're at the bottom of the play and you're the 10 seed. As long as you can get your team into the playoffs, that's all that matters at the end of the day. It doesn't matter if you're the one seed or the 10 seed. But the problem with the Lakers was that we did not see this. Westbrook came into the season looking, as always, some form of injured. And that's not a knock on Westbrook, but even dating back to his days in Oklahoma City or his brief stint in Houston, you would always just see him come in with some underlying hamstring or quad injury. And as an explosive player as he is, I mean, it only makes sense. But I just think maybe he needs to dabble in resting it rather than trying to play through his slumps. You see these guys like Damian Lillard who are willing to take a season off and recoup and regather their full 100% strength so that next year, even though Dame's fighting a losing battle in Portland and everyone knows that, but you just kind of wish that Russ would maybe sit the first 20 or 30 games rather than you know what I'm saying, try to force and will his way to that victory, which I guess you can admire, but I mean, we all see what happens with progressive overload and it's not pretty for anyone's career long-term. The next one, pretty self-explanatory. There's a reason Frank Vogel isn't there in the front office right now or on the court coaching the Lakers anymore. Another thing happening in the Lakers organization is that there's little to no morale and no accountability, especially after losing, I think for the first like 40 to 60 games this season, every single interview where the Lakers lost and Westbrook or LeBron and Anthony were asked about, you know, what happened here, what happened there. I just can't remember a time where their heads were up looking straight at the reporters and giving them an answer that was not to belittle their characters or anything but they the way they r answered was just not very professional in my opinion like you guys are in LA and you you know brought this big expectation onto yourself if you're not fulfilling it it's only right that the reporters are asking you why you're not fulfilling it because just like you they got families to feed and that's their job so when you lose a game because you have a bad performance don't take it out on some reporter like and that just brings to the second topic that if you look up i didn't even say anything about it the ego issues in la i mean there's just a lot of big ball handler hall of fame big personality talent in a los angeles locker room i mean that just speaks for itself so i figured i didn't have to say anything they obviously settle with championship fatigue i mean with the bubble there's a whole nother big layer of fatigue i think that was added on to this because there's a mental fatigue along with the physical fatigue they are just settling it just looked like for at least the first 20 or 30 games of the season I mean there was no desire or rush to turn it around and and then you see LeBron making these cryptic tweets on Twitter talking about how the Lakers season is going to turn around and and everything is going to look up and they're not missing the lake show isn't missing the playoffs and I mean I don't know you guys saw how the season ended Due to all these reasons, I have no idea why this move was made in the first place, but it happens. It can't be undone. Unless... In all seriousness, after reviewing a team like the Lakers and their poor talent management, let's view... The Clippers don't run into problems when it comes to depth. They have veterans who know their role both offensively and defensively, such as Nicholas Batum, Robert Covington, and Norman Powell. They also have young core players like Terrence Mann and Nevitia Zubats who have played great in the minutes they received in season and during the playoffs. It's a series like the 2021 
Western Conference Semifinals that makes you want to invest your stock in the Clippers. In a series where you're down 2-1 in the closing 5 minutes of the game, you desperately need to win versus the one-seeded Jazz in the West before we knew they were a joke. Your superstar Kawhi Leonard goes down with what was discovered to be a devastating ACL tear. Truly a sad story. But little did Utah fans know it would have a happy Clipper ending. Terrence Mann shocks the world and erupts for 39 points in a closeout game going 7 for 10 from the three-point line and showing the entire world how to expose the Utah Jazz's defensive scheme. Now there's two things I haven't mentioned, the coaching and the underappreciation for Paul George. It's funny that Ty Lu and Paul George are similar in that manner, experts at what they do but always clowned in the mainstream media. Paul George combined for 65 points on 49% from the field and 37% from the three in games five and six without Kawhi Leonard. Ty Lue made the correct adjustments and subs to hold Rudy Gobert and the Utah Jazz accountable for their flaws. The Clippers then go on to lose in a hard-fought six-game series against the Phoenix Suns. Paul averaged 28 points, 10 rebounds, and 5 assists on the series, including a legendary Game 5 performance where he recorded 41 points, 13 rebounds, 6 assists, 3 steals, 75% from the field, 100% from the free throw line, and 50% from the field in a must-win Game 5. Now here's where we get to the fun part, the future. The 2023 Clippers will be retooled with a healthy and rested superstar duo in Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, a newly acquired John Wall who I really think will embody being a Clipper both offensively and defensively, some more talented and experienced young role players and veterans who chose to commit and re-sign in hopes of winning an NBA championship. I really like the structure of the Clippers going forward. As long as they stay healthy, which yes, is a big, big aspect of basketball, I think every NBA franchise should be looking out for the 2022 and 2023 LA Clippers as they are my title favorites.